get started. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, What's New in Kubernetes 1.18. I'm Karen Chu, Community Program Manager at Microsoft and CNCF Ambassador, and I will be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters today. We have Jeremy Rickard, Enhancements Lead, George Alicorn, Release Lead, and myself, the Comms Lead from 1.18. And just before we start, um, a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions there and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please just be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recordings and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Jeremy and George to kick off today's presentation. Thanks so much, Karen. So we'll start off today just by giving a, a little brief overview about the, the, uh, the logo for the 118 release. Every release has, uh, has its own personality and its own kind of representation. Uh, if you remember the 116 release, there was a, a great logo uh, based around breadsticks. Maki, who is the release lead, that was a big fan of breadsticks and the Olive Garden. So that kind of featured into the, through the release. So let's start off this webinar by having um, a little bit of background on how this came to be. Yeah, absolutely. So at least one of the secrets about the release team is um, whenever you become the, uh, whenever you get into the uh, release lead position, uh, you have the privilege of uh, desi uh, designing the logo for the, uh, for the, uh, for the given release uh, as lead for 118. I took the opportunity and ran with it. And the logo for 118, uh, 118 is inspired by the LHC, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, which is a, 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 an ex a physics experiment meant to explore the really fundamental questions of a uh, really fundamental questions of physics. Uh, at least part, of, uh, at least part of the uh, part of the motivation is because before I, st I actually started working as a software a software engineer, I. Uh, I was a physicist, and uh, I keep the physics around still, even uh, even to this point, uh, every now and then. And one, I wanted to take the opportunity, wanted to take the opportunity to talk about uh, a little bit about physics. And the other one is that the LHC is a uh, like the Kubernetes, uh, like the Kubernetes community is a really large, uh, a really large collaboration. They have thousands of people from uh, from all around the globe, constantly working towards uh, trying to gain a better understanding of the underlying uh, underlying laws of physics and like the kubernetes like the kubernetes community uh, like the kubernetes community they are very inclusive and they are doing uh, they are doing a lot uh, a lot of really meaningful and super uh, super interesting uh, super interesting work and i want uh, wanted to take the opportunity to um, uh, to, uh, to just give a uh, give a shout out uh, not uh, not only to them but uh, to a lot of uh, uh, Community, uh, communities of scientists and, and engineers who are not only working on the LHC but another uh, another experiments for physics, biology, and the like. Be uh, because ulti uh, ultimately, it is my belief that if you want to go uh, if you want to go far and if you want to build really cool and inter uh, cool, interesting, and useful things, uh, having uh, having uh, having a community, having a really large and diver uh, diverse community is going to be uh, the best opportunity that you have to advance. Uh, to advance things. Awesome, thank you so much for that background. I think that it's a super cool logo and uh, I've been trying to 3D print it to have like a physical memento of it. It's, I think it's turning out pretty cool. <laughs> also working on the swag. So at, so, uh, at some point there'll be shirts and if people are interested, please feel free to ping. Nice, thanks. So today the agenda for this webinar is gonna allow us to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, 118. We'll give you a couple of quick highlights of things that we think are super important to, uh, to bring forward. Uh, we'll also give you a really quick update on the 119 release with things that are going on and um, then dive into a little bit of an overview of each one of the enhancements that came into the, the release. We'll also have a period of Q&A at the end. So first up, let's talk about the 119 release. 
because that's kicking off right now. So we're here to talk about 118, but 119 is, is pretty relevant, I think, as well. Um, as consumers of Kubernetes, you might be interested to know when the 119 release will happen. Um, originally, that was supposed to be June 30th, but because of everything that's happening in the world, uh, it's been extended a little bit. So the new target date is August 4th. Uh, and there's a lot of changes that are going into this with, with, with regard to the, the timelines and the dates within the release. Uh, but we wanted to make you aware of just when the, the target of the, the 119 release would be. So you can kind of do some better planning about when you might adopt uh, that release. If you're interested in reading more, um, the slides will be available at the end, but I've included a link here to um, discussion forum in the Kubernetes dev mailing list where a lot of these things have been spelled out. So you can see some very specific things like uh, what's gonna happen with 120 afterwards, what are some of the changes we're trying to implement within the, the release this time. Okay, hey. so. With that, one, one, uh, oh, sorry, uh, one, uh, one quick, uh, one quick uh, thing to add. Also, with uh, with the changes in the one uh, one nineteen uh, release, and uh, this uh, this will possibly also be very similar to uh, to the uh, for the one twenty release. So there, uh, so the one twenty. Uh, uh, usually we have four, rele uh, four releases per year. Uh, this year we're only going to have uh, one, uh, 118, 119, and 120. 120, that's a growing plan. And one additional change that's going to, uh, one additional change that's going to happen is that uh, the release team is going to start publishing a lot more release candidates. So all the things that we're going to be talking about right here, uh, one, good place to, uh, to test them out was with the uh, Kubernetes release candidate, which was released before the uh, official 118.0 release. And 118 is gonna have a lot more of those. So, uh, so, you can, uh, so all the new enhancements are being worked on. You can actually, uh, you can actually try them out and kick the, uh, kick the tires with them. Yeah, that's a great point to, to bring in. Okay, so let's dive into the 118 enhancements now. Um, so I was the enhancements lead for 118, so I'll give you a quick overview. Um, in 118, we had 38 total things that we tracked. Uh, 15 of those things were stable. That means that they've graduated to being fully released and supported. Um, you can expect them to, to live forever uh, with some level of confidence within Kubernetes and not change too much. 11 of those things graduated to beta, which means that they think that the people working on those features think that the API is reaching the point of stability. Uh, changes could happen going forward, but you can expect them to probably live um, and have a certain set of stability and testing going into them. Uh, those things are usually enabled by default as well. And then 12 things were introduced as alpha features. Those are brand new things that are being added to Kubernetes and they're gonna be behind feature gates. So to use them, you'll have to enable them uh, to take advantage of those features. But you can see it was a pretty good spread. Um, almost equally divided between the categories, uh, giving us a good mix of, of brand new things and um, some promotions of things that have been around for a little while. So uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Jorge to do a little bit of highlights. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, so as Jeremy already mentioned, uh, one, of the, one of the themes that we chose for this release was a uh, fit and finish uh, because we have a, a we, we have a lot more things that are being worked on, uh, really, uh, really cool, uh, really cool features that people are testing out and seeing how uh, seeing how they work in the wild. But we also uh, we also have an equal uh, an equal proportion of features that are going to be stable, and uh, we uh, we believe that they are completely ready for produ uh, for production use. Uh, and with that, let's go on to the next slide to see some, uh, some, uh, some of the changes that we want to highlight out, uh, out of the bag. One of, the, uh, one of them is actually with Clango. One of the, a lot of, a lot of people use Kubernetes to host their applications, uh, but one, uh, another very important use is to actually build operators or build programs uh, on, top, uh, on top of Kubernetes. And this is where Clango comes in. With 1.18, there, uh, there was a, really large change that, uh, that went into the code base where now every single method the uh, every single method in client go is now going to take a context as a, a as a first argument and this more or less aligns client go with there uh, to be more 
co-idiomatic to uh, to align more with uh, with other API API libraries that you might uh, that you might see in the uh, that you might have seen in the in the wild. So now, when, uh, whenever you start your application, if you create a if you create a context for your application to uh, keep track of what is actually what is actually happening, you can pass that context uh, for every uh, for every single a a Kubernetes API call. Uh, couple a couple other a couple other things that also change is that most uh, a lot of a lot of fu uh, function for, uh, signatures also change, and 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 now, and now for the uh, now for the most part, most uh, most functions besides taking uh, taking a context and some information about the Kubernetes object that you want to handle, uh, you know, for example, a config map or a pod, they're also going to take some options kind of a uh, options kind of argument, uh, which uh, where you can specify some additional met uh, metadata for the. Uh, for, for your operation. And one project uh, that, uh, that is being developed within the, uh, within the Kubernetes uh, organization, uh, you can actually find it in Kubernetes 6, uh, in github.com, Kubernetes 6, client go fix. This one is going to help you actually uh, adapt, your, uh, adapt your programs to, the, uh, to, this new, uh, to this new way of writing a client go applications and Jeremy has actually has actually given it a try. Is a are there any highlights that you like to share with the audience at this moment? Yeah, I mean, I think the tool is really useful. Manually upgrading to uh, client go one eighteen um, obviously introduces these changes. Um, the context one is pretty big, but the uh, the other ones too. Like uh, in, when you have a delete operation, previously it accepted things by reference and now it's by value. So there's just a lot of changes that you have to go through. Um, I had changes across like 54 files in this project that I was updating yesterday and uh, client go fix is pretty nice. It's still in beta. So make sure you have a backup of things because it does in place changes, but uh, it can help you out a lot when you're dealing with this change. So on to a stability, a couple, a couple of enhancements uh, the one in for, uh, for 118 are to in, uh, to improve the stability, uh, the improve the stability of the project in really cool ways are uh, taint based evictions, a uh, cube cuddle diff, API server dry run, CI, uh, CSI block storage support, and Windows improvements. Improvements overall, uh, overall, you can see that people uh, that people have been working in uh, almost all areas of Kubernetes uh, equally. Uh, you have uh, you have some tools to improve uh, to improve how uh, developers and operators work. A, a work and apply changes to their clusters, and this is where uh, the kube cuddle div and API server dry run actually come into play. Your, uh, these two enhancements are going to enable you to have a better uh, a better feel for what is actually happening and what is actually going to happen after you do some operation. Uh, Time uh, based eviction uh, shows a better, a better user experience for people uh, for people who actually who actually make use of taints uh, or are doing some system admi uh, system administration on their clusters, a uh, block store uh, block storage support uh, that's been a uh, that's been a major one, and we are going to talk more about it uh, uh, later uh, later on on this webinar. And Windows improvements, uh, this is by far one of the most uh, one of the uh, one of the very uh, one of the most exciting areas in Kubernetes during the uh, during the past couple of releases. Uh, we have seen how we uh, Kubernetes started to support. Uh, using uh, using Windows OSs as actual worker nodes. Uh, in previous releases, we saw the adoption grow more, and we uh, we started to actually uh, we actually uh, we started to actually uh, run a lot more uh, a lot more com uh, complex end to end uh, end to end tests on Kubernetes uh, using uh, uh, using Windows uh, uh, worker nodes. And fin uh, finally, in this release, we're gonna uh, we're gonna see a lot of uh, a lot of changes. Uh, on Windows that make, that make it feel a lot more like the usual uh, Linux-based worker nodes, uh, along with uh, along with some other enhancements that enable people to uh, to manage uh, Kubernetes clusters that, uh, that use Windows for uh, for, uh, for example uh, for example by using tools uh, such as Cube uh, Cube Admin. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting thing to come into the project, and it's awesome to see it progress. And as far as new things go, we also uh, we uh, we have also seen some enhancements that uh, try to tackle uh, try to tackle some uh, uh, 
some uh, some some complex issues that uh, that, uh, that people uh, that people have come across. Uh, a lot of organizations, uh, a lot of organizations are using Kubernetes, uh, and you know, for uh, for the most part, uh, you have your standard clusters with some tens or hundreds of nodes. But a lot of uh, a lot of people ha are really pushing the boundaries with uh, the kind of things that you can do with Kubernetes, and we have seen a lot of issues when you are running thou uh, thousands of pods, thousands uh, thousands of nodes. And one uh, one of the really cool enhancements that came into one uh, one eighteen is pr uh, priority and fairness for API server request. Uh, this more or less en enables us to have a more reliable installa installation of Kubernetes where we, uh, where we can actually separa uh, separate the requests that are uh, landing into the API server and we can Throttle some of them to uh, to allow for the uh, to allow for the most important uh, to allow for other important uh, requests to go in and uh, and allow uh, allow people uh, allow people to have a more consistent uh, user uh, user experience where uh, when interacting with a, a really low a loaded cluster uh, the other uh, another cool one is uh, cube cuddle debugging like all the other enhancements that I'm mentioning, uh, we're going to talk more uh, more about this one later on. But if you uh, have heard about it, uh, just know that this is uh, that this is on the works and it's so, uh, and it's uh, close uh, and each day is closer and closer to be uh, to be in GA. Uh, but Cube uh, Cube Cuddle debug is definitely going to be uh, def uh, definitely going to be a game changer. Configure a uh, configurable HPA scale velocity. I. HPA is uh, HPA at this point in time is something so uh, so ubiquitous. So having more ways to tune it, it's gonna it's gonna be amazing. And immutable secrets and config maps also help uh, uh, de uh, developers interact uh, interact with their Kubernetes clusters in a more secure uh, secure manner to prevent any accidental mistakes or applies. Great. Thanks for uh, giving us those quick overviews. So next we're gonna go through updates for each one of the SIGs. So when things are, are worked on in Kubernetes, they generally fall underneath of the purview of a, a SIG. Uh, so that could be something like authentication or API machinery or storage. Um, so each one of the updates that comes into the release uh, is, is kind of shepherded by the SIGs and they have responsibility for um, getting it across the line. Uh, so we've organized things by SIG so we can give you a better understanding of, of how things have changed in the release. We'll start out with API machinery. Uh, so like we previously mentioned, priority and fairness for API server requests is one that came in. Um, and for each one of these items, uh, when you get the slides later on, you can actually click through to the tracking issue and the enhancement proposal or CAP uh, to see what's been proposed, what's been implemented so far, and what the plans are for each one of these things going forward. In the notes, we've also included blogs. Um, so in some of these features had dedicated blogs written for them. Uh, some of them didn't. Uh, this one did. Uh, so in speaker notes for this, you'll be able to find um, a, a nice overview of, of this feature. Uh, so, but at a high level, um, this is a brand new one coming into the, into the release, uh, into Kubernetes. And we mentioned previously that things uh, kind of broke down between the lines of alpha, beta, and, and stable. Um, this was one that's brand new, so it is an alpha issue. And, and really, um, in addition to what we've mentioned for this one already, uh, this really helps us prevent, uh, you know, clobbering the API server under heavy load, uh, keeping things going, keeping people from stepping on each other when they're making API server requests. Next one is uh, API server network proxy kept uh, proxy to beta. Uh, some of the titles here are not. Um, is everybody seeing it? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so these are the, the, the titles from the, the issues in the repository. So they need probably a little bit of, of uh, massaging, but here, you know, we're moving the API server network proxy to beta. So this is something that's existed. Uh, it landed, almost landed in 117, didn't quite make it. So it's made it into 118. Um, it allows you to separate uh, user, user initiated network traffic from API server initiated traffic, uh, doing you know, that kind of segregation to again, help people control how requests are going. Um, and yes. add, 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 add into the add into this enhancement. Uh, I've, uh, 
one uh, one really quick note is that if the usefulness of this at least uh, at least one of the uh, one of the things that you can uh, really tackle with this one is that if you can differentiate whether uh, if your traffic is coming from users or from a uh, or from actual applications you can uh, be more restrict when it comes to uh, secu uh, security and compliance to only allow cert uh, certain uh, certain entities to do uh, certain uh, types of operations. So uh, this, uh, this enhancement is something that's been mentioned a lot by cloud providers who want to enable uh, users to have a more secure experience for, uh, when working on, with managed Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes uh, offerings. But uh, you know, same uh, same uh, this enhancement can really be uh, can really be used in uh, by anyone in that in that kind of manner. So if anyone uh, if anyone has uses where you uh, where you will actually want to know whether our user is doing something or uh, manage application is uh, is doing something else, uh, keep uh, keep an eye on this one. Yeah. Um, so one other point to mention as we go through these slides, uh, we're, we're going to mention the status so alpha, beta, or stable. Um, one thing to keep in mind with these is that alpha features and beta features both have feature gates associated, or feature flags associated with them. Um, when something's in alpha, by default, it's not going to be turned on. You'll have to go and enable that in the, the feature flag. Uh, when things go to beta, they're on by default. So you can turn them off if you don't want to use them, but by default, they will be on. And then when things move to stable, the feature flag is dropped. So that feature just becomes part of uh, all installations of Kubernetes. So here we have a stable. So we've gone from uh, an alpha to a beta to a stable. Um, this has existed in Kubernetes for quite a while. Uh, it's been beta since 1.13. So it's had a quite a, quite a few releases where this thing has, has been around. Um, but in 1.18, we see it finally land as a stable, stable feature. And this uh, and this one uh, this one is particularly useful for uh, for people who are working uh, who are working on uh, de developing some application on top of Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing some uh, com uh, some complex change on the cluster, at least uh, at least one uh, at least one of the uh, one of the things that didn't ha that didn't happen before is that. Uh, if you have so, if you just want to run a pod, for example, in in that pod you're running uh, De uh, Debian, uh, you know you can do a kube uh, kube apply, try run, and it's gonna tell you whether something happened or not. But uh, at least with the API server try run, actually uh, sending uh, sending the request all the way to the API server, passing through any uh, admission webhooks or anything else that you have configured along the way that might uh, that might uh, that might change the way that your manifest is going to be handled and created on the cluster. Uh, this is going to give uh, this is going to give you all that information uh, all that information that you need. And if you use kubectl a uh, kubectl apply dry run, it's going to do the client uh, diff by default. Uh, so if you just do dry run, that's uh, that's what's going to happen. If you want, uh, if you actually want the API server to do it, you have to specify a dry run equals server. Yeah, that's a great point to add. Thank you so much. Okay, so back to our client Go issue we talked about before. Um, we're giving you a little bit of an example here, but again, this is a change to client Go. Um, you can see that the structure of calls change. So uh, when we want to get pods using client Go. It looks a little something like this. Uh, you ask for the core v1 API group, and then you would ask for pods in a certain namespace, and then you do the operation of get. Uh, before you used client go from 118, you wouldn't have to specify that context parameter as the first parameter. Now you have to. Um, there is, if you go through the, um, the tracking issue, um, you can actually use some generated clients uh, that will be around until 121. Uh, that don't have that. So you, you still have to change imports and, and whatnot, but uh, you can keep the signatures around for a little bit longer, but that will be removed in 121. So you'll eventually have to make this transition anyway. Um, in the speaker notes here, again, we've linked to um, the client go fix tool. Um, thanks to Jordan Liggett for that. It's, uh, it's really useful. All right, now on to SIG architecture. So, uh, so one of the first enhancements from SIG architecture that we are going to talk about is enable running conformance tests without beta REST APIs or features. Um, so, uh, so uh, at least some context that is really useful when, th uh, when talking about uh, uh, conformance is that uh, these tests are supposed, uh, these are end-to-end -end tests that are uh, managed and maintained by Kubernetes contributors and they, uh, they sleep with, uh, with the rest of the core Kubernetes code. 
a, conform, a conformance tests are supposed to give you some sense of uh, reliability. Uh, they're, uh, they're meant to tell you whether your Kubernetes, uh, whether your Kubernetes installation is actually working the way, uh, the way that it is intended to. And to, uh, to that end, a conformance test tend to only test a product a production a production ready a production ready features uh, because anything that uh, anything that is in alpha uh, it might partially work it might have so it might have some changes uh, with uh, we don't really know and hence it's being kept in alpha things that are in beta are a little bit more uh, a little bit more stable but uh, we don't really have any sense that they are going uh, you know they they may stay they may still change so, so having uh, having uh, having the set of conformance tests only test out G, uh, GA APIs and uh, GA APIs and features, it's really helpful uh, for people who manage their own Kubernetes clusters to ensure that your installation uh, your installation process is working as uh, as expected, and all, uh, and equally useful for anyone uh, for anyone who manage uh, who manages Kubernetes cluster for other organizations or other uh, or other users. Well, let's move on to the next one, which is SIG off. Um, first one we'll talk about is a brand new alpha feature. So again, to use this, you'd have to enable the feature gate for this. Um, but this is providing the ability for OIDC discovery endpoints in the API server to be used outside of the API server. And this is cool because it enables you to do things like um, use authentication tokens from Kubernetes uh, to be used as a general authentication mechanism. So you could use it for services outside the cluster as well. Uh, and federate things to other clusters. It's kind of neat. Um, next is uh, some changes to the certificate signing request API. Uh, so if you want to use um, Kubernetes to generate a CA, um, and, or obtain certificates from a CA, uh, you can do something called a certificate signing request. And this API had some changes in 115 or 118. Uh, it's planned to go stable and graduate to stable in 119. Okay, on to SIG auto scaling. And one of the enhancements that I already mentioned uh, from SIG auto scaling is the uh, is the capacity, uh, the ability to configure the scale velocity of horizontal uh, HPA, which uh, stands for horizontal uh, horizontal pod auto scalers. So uh, in the, uh, so in this case, you whenever uh, whenever you have a deployment staples or, or so, uh, something of the sort, uh, normally you have the capacity. Uh, normally you have the capacity to specify what threshold of CPU or memory utilization these uh, these resources should be using, and how uh, how to scale up. Uh, whether you have a minimum ROM, a number of replicas or a maximum number of replicas, and then HPA handle how many replicas to. Uh, to uh, to create based on the uh, based on the utilization and the target util uh, utilization, one new uh, one uh, one new way the auto the secret, uh, auto scaling is uh, enabling us to uh, to fine tune this process is by allowing uh, allowing us to tell uh, HPA, HPA resources. How fast, uh, how fast to scale? And for example, in the slides, you can uh, you can see how that uh, how that's going, uh, going to look. So whenever you're defining your HPA ma uh, manifest in YAML, you can have uh, you can have something like behavior scale up your policies, and now you can uh, now you can actually say I want to scale up by this uh, by this percentage, and 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 that way and that way just. Uh, Accommodate, uh, accommodate the behavior of the cluster to your particular uh, to your particular application. All right, let's move on to SIG CLI now. Uh, and the first one that we'll talk about is that debug command that uh, we mentioned earlier. Um, this one actually builds on top of the ephemeral containers uh, alpha feature that was introduced a little while ago. Uh, and what this allows you to do is to add pods. So the ephemeral containers enhancement allows you to add new pods to, or containers to a pod. Um, so maybe you deploy your, your workloads normally um, and you, you follow good practices and you don't include things like a shell or um, you know, the ability to, like, to run bash inside of that container. Uh, you want to lower the, the attack vectors, right? But that also makes it a little bit 
tricky to debug sometimes. Uh, so ephemeral containers allow you to spin up a new container inside of that pod that might be able to you know, share a volume or do some other things to help you um, take advantage of uh, or to do some debugging. Um, to do that though, there wasn't really anything exposed in kubectl to help you do that. So that is what this debug command is doing. This is allowing you to, um, to take a pod that's already running and add an ephemeral debug container to it. Uh, you can find some more information in the enhancement proposal to see what they plan on adding in addition to just this, uh, you know, running the ephemeral container alongside things. Um, and again, it is an alpha feature. So um, to actually use this in kubectl, uh, like a feature gate, you have to use kubectl, uh, I believe it's alpha debug um, to, to trigger this. But I think it's cool and it shows some progression uh, and some more kind of developer user focused changes that are coming into the the platform or into the ecosystem and to uh, to give one uh, one quick uh, one quick example on that one uh, for example let's think of an average uh, of a, a typical application let's say that you're writing a web server in go a uh, the, the best thing that you could do is to compile that web server uh, so that you end up only with a, a binary. Then that binary copy it into a container using a distroless a, a container image. That distroless container image is only going to have enough resources for your a binary to be executed and run. It's, but it's not going to have any bash. It's not going to have any other utilities. There is no way for you to install anything. So if you actually do something like you cut all the bug, you can a, create a new container and run it within the same set of uh, Linux namespaces, so that uh, so that you can actually interact with your app, uh, you can actually interact with your uh, with your application. So something that you could do in uh, in production, for example, is to have your web server up and running, and then you run your additional container. In that one, you install something like curl, and then you cur uh, you curl from localhost. Yeah, I think it's a it's a perfect use case to show how to use that. Uh, so the next one is kubectl diff. Um, so this allows you to compare an object uh, on your file system. So if you have a YAML file that defines maybe a deployment or um, some other resource, and you want to compare that against what's actually running in the cluster, so you can kind of compare that state that you think it might be with what it actually is, then uh, this command is pretty useful for that. Again, this is a stable one. Um, it's been around for a little while, and it's, uh, it's ready to use in production. This one's not really a super user facing one, but it's, in, it's interesting to track, especially if you're building anything that depends on, um, on uh, the code. Uh, the kubectl package itself has moved um, to a, a new repo. So you can find some more information about this in the enhancement proposal as well. All right, let's move on to cloud provider. Jorge, take it away. Absolutely. So with Cloud Provider, another uh, another one of the enhancements that came in during 118 is uh, supporting the BS uh, the BSphere a uh, cloud prov uh, cloud provider. One of uh, one of the areas where we have been trying to improve uh, in the past is to move the cloud provider from inside of Kubernetes to its uh, to uh, to its own, uh, to its own place so that they can be developed and ma uh, maintained uh, separ uh, separately from the core of Kubernetes, si uh, similar uh, similar to the a previous enhancement that we just mentioned where uh, people wanted to move uh, all the code for kubectl outside and in uh, in this case a uh, bsphere is going uh, it's one of the first cl uh, cloud providers that is uh, that is actually uh, been uh, been worked uh, been worked on this manner cool and well, let's move on to cluster lifecycle so the first one here is support for Windows and kubedm. So you've actually been able to use kubedm a little bit with Windows, um, but the, this gives you the ability to add uh, nodes to a kubedm Windows cluster, which is pretty cool. Uh, before, you couldn't easily do that. Um, kubedm is a way of provisioning clusters. Um, there's tons of ways of, you can get a cluster, but kubedm is a really useful way. Um, it allows you to do a lot of things, rotate certs, uh, add nodes to clusters. Before this enhancement, uh, you weren't really able to do that with Windows containers, uh, with Windows nodes. Um, this, uh, the ability to use Windows with kubeadm has been around since 114, but until 118, you weren't really able to add uh, nodes to clusters and make it really a useful tool. All right, on to SIG network. The first enhancement from SIG network, in the, uh, SIG network that we want to discuss is uh, adding an app protocol to services and endpoints. This one is alpha, uh, alpha gated. So the only way that you can actually uh, give it a try 
is to en enable the feature gate for this one. And this enhancement uh, essentially allows us to, uh, to specify whether a service or an endpoint is going to be using TCP, UDP, SCTP, or something of, uh, something of the sort. Uh, this, uh, this is related to a, uh, to a previous enhancement from the 170, uh, 117 release cycle where endpoint slice went, uh, went into beta. And endpoint, uh, endpoint slices actually, uh, actually introduced the concept of a protocol, uh, which uh, will, uh, will allow a way for people to specify uh, uh, to specify that a given port is actually dedicated for a spe uh, for a specific type of uh, for a specific type of protocol, and the, the uh, this enhancement is going to uh, it, it's proposing to us uh, to allow the same set of functionality uh, from uh, introduced by uh, from introduced by the endpoint slices cap into uh, normal services and endpoints. The next one is IPv6, uh, IPv6 support. One huge area of development in Kubernetes uh, for the last uh, for the last couple of years has been on uh, IP, uh, has been on IPv6, and now with this enhancement going uh, going into beta for the uh, which again means that for the most part most uh, a lot of people are going to be getting this by uh, getting this by default, and you can actually uh, you can actually give it a uh, give it a try with your uh, Kubernetes clusters. This enhancement uh, means that um, IPv6 only clusters are going to uh, are uh, are expected uh, are expected to work. The IPv6 only uh, IPv6 only functionality was actually added back in 1.9 as an alpha feature, and th and this allowed for. Uh, uh, this uh, this allowed for if uh, this allowed for a cluster to use only IP uh, to uh, to replace all IPv uh, IPv4 networking. And the other uh, the other couple things that come to mind is uh, uh, with uh, back in uh, back in Kubernetes one uh, one uh, one thirteen uh, the default DNS server uh, server also changed uh, core, uh, core DNS to have full IPv IPv six support. So as we uh, as we con uh, as we continue roll, uh, rolling on, uh, rolling in with this one, it's gonna be possible to have all your Kubernetes components just uh, use IP, uh, just use IPv six. And the next enhancement, uh, which is a new endpoint, a new endpoint API, this one is uh, again in a beta, in a beta status, and this is uh, meant to replace a core v1 endpoint uh, to mitigate some performance and scal uh, some performance and scal uh, scalability issues. And this one, uh, job uh, already uh, already mentioned it by another name, but. Uh, to provide the full story, this is what we mean by the endpoint slice a a API. The long-term plan is to have this uh, to uh, to have this one uh, be the uh, the core uh, the, like the, the core API when uh, to uh, to use when doing a uh, when doing anything uh, anything uh, anything with networking. The current. Uh, the, the current service API has some, uh, as we mentioned, some uh, some perform uh, some performance issues that were discovered with scalability tests where we ramp up the number of nodes up to five thousand and try to, and try to see how things behave. Uh, also, uh, and this enhancement is going to uh, essentially instead of recomputing the entire list of endpoints that a service is using. This, and then notifying all the uh, all the watchers, all the entities that are actually uh, watching for changes to these endpoints. Uh, this and uh, this enhancement is going to allow uh, this loop to be uh, to be broken down uh, to be broken down into different groups, and only the group that has the uh, that that is using a certain endpoint has to be has to be recomputed, uh, recomputed and updated. Well, let's move on to the next one now, which is. Mm -hmm. Graduate node local DNS cache to GA. So graduating a lock a node local DNS a cache. This is going to a, this is an a, this is a new item that a, that runs DNS that runs a DNS cache pod as a, a demon said. 
and over, uh, overall, it's just expected to improve the, perf uh, the performance of DNS across uh, close cost, uh, clusters. The next, uh, the next one, ingress changes. This one is in beta. Uh, this one is in beta state. And this will uh, it, uh, this uh, this enhancement for 118 adds a uh, wildcard uh, support for wildcard host names, a uh, better a uh, better path matching, and the declaration of uh, ingress classes. This one's um, pretty interesting, I think, because it's uh, it's just more work building on top of ingress to make it a better resource to use um, as they work towards doing a GA release, which is hopefully soon. Duplicate slide there. All right, let's move on to SIG node now. So the first one here is uh, changes to pod overhead. Um, so when you are running things, there's a little bit of uh, non-negligible overhead associated with keeping track of the pod, uh, quota management, uh, things that go into, you know, that are necessary to run the workloads. Uh, and this is accounting for those when it's making for the pod sandbox, not just the specific containers. So there's a sandbox that goes along with each one of your pods. Um, and that wasn't really taken into consideration when scheduling decisions and things were hap happening. Um, so this is uh, moving that along. This has been in alpha for a little while and moving to beta in 118. So you'll be able to take advantage of this without turning the feature gate on. Next one up is the topology manager. Um, so giving you the ability to uh, run uh, pieces of Kubernetes in, and, and workloads in, uh, in different um, hardware topologies. So basically like if you have some, some GPU nodes or other things that you wanna run uh, low latency uh, workloads in, um, this is allowing you to do that. And this was introduced as an alpha in 116 and it's going in beta in 118. So you can see that in a fairly short amount of time, this is turned around. Uh, you can expect this to be around um, as a stable thing somewhere down the road. This one also has a dedicated blog post associated with it. So you can go read a lot of information about this at, uh, on the Kubernetes blog. Uh, and again, in the feature notes, or sorry, in the speaker notes here, uh, we've included a link to that blog. Next up is adding uh, startup liveness probe holdoffs. So sometimes you have, um, pods that are really slow to start and maybe the um, the health checks or the liveness probes start to fail and then the pod gets killed. Um, this allows you to uh, set an initialization failure threshold so that you can back things off and not necessarily start um, handling the failures on, on really slow to start um, containers. This one's beta as well. Uh, it's been around for a little bit um, since 1.16, uh, but now it's beta so you'll be able to use this without turning feature flags on. Uh, this one is actually a change to a feature that's been stable for a little while. Um, uh, huge pages is, is, is a feature that I haven't really used, but um, for using clusters that have a, that are using a lot of data, um, this one allows you to make some changes uh, to, to use the feature a little bit more efficiently. Uh, again, you can find more information in the tracking issue and the enhancement proposal. All right, SIG scheduling. And like other six, uh, the people from six scheduling have been uh, have been really busy, and there are a lot of re uh, really cool uh, new enhancements uh, enhancements coming in for one eighteen. One of them is a, is a more even spread of prods ac across failure domains. Uh, this way. Uh, this way, this one is in beta, so for a lot of people, this is going to be turned on by default. And one, one of the things that often that often comes up is that people are, if you if you have a cluster in a given region and the region has multiple availability zones, if you have multiple if you have multiple replicas to allow for a high availability configuration. The optimal, the optimal configuration that you will want is to have at least one replica of your application running in each availability zone. That way, if there is some issue with the infrastructure, uh, there is always going to be something open, avail uh, open available. And this enhancement essentially improves uh, on that by, uh, play, uh, by playing around with the and the 
it is it essentially allows uh, for like uh, for that configuration to happen even when uh, when uh, when using anti affinity uh, rules or uh, or other interpod uh, configurations. Right, this one's been alpha since one sixteen, so in a sh pretty short amount of time, it's gone to beta and will be around for people to use. It's pretty pretty cool. Yeah, and like that one thing, basic eviction. Uh, this one was actually uh, was also mentioned at the uh, we also mentioned at the beginning of this uh, talk webinar. This one will automatically uh, this uh, this one is unstable, and this means um, uh, automatically any tainted nodes with no uh, with no execute uh, will become unready and uh, and unreachable. Uh, so. Uh, no, uh, no bots. Nothing will get scheduled. Uh, will get scheduled on, uh, on these ones. Uh, this enhancement has been beta since uh, since one thirteen, and yep. Uh, this also builds on the taint node by condition feature that went to uh, GA in one seventeen. So some some awesome progression there from uh, from that sig. The next enhancement is uh, it's uh, adding a configurable default event pod spreading rule. Uh, this uh, again going up, uh, talk, uh, talking about highly available configurations. This uh, this adds a default spreading rule to uh, to pods that don't uh, that don't define one and allow uh, operators to define it. So uh, again, uh, another uh, another tool to ensure that your applications are uh, highly available and uh, tolerant of any infrastructure failures. The next enhancement: uh, running multiple scheduling profiles. Uh, this is uh, this is particular uh, particularly interesting. Uh, for the, uh, for the most part, a lot of people uh, a lot of people can get, uh, can get by with the uh, with the default behavior, and uh, but there are a lot of people that are using hybrid uh, that, that are using and building hybrid uh, hybrid clusters. Uh, you know, for example, uh, for example, if you have a bunch of nodes to run uh, web servers. Uh, some uh, some other nodes to run your uh, to run your databases, but then you actually start doing a lot of uh, machine learning and the like, and you start bringing in a really specialized a uh, really specialized CPUs or GPUs uh, that uh, that kind of thing. Uh, if you start treating all your worker nodes uh, like they are the same, you might probably be missing out on a lot of. Uh, a lot of optimization, and this enhancement that just uh, that just went stable on one thing is actually going to enable users to specify their own uh, scheduling profile to uh, to tell uh, a scheduler or multiple uh, or multiple schedulers how to run uh, uh, how to uh, how to run uh, how to run different workloads. This is all. Uh, this is also going to help. Uh, this is also going to help for people. Uh, it is going to be useful for people who are actually running multi, uh, multiple schedulers because uh, now you can uh, kind of get by by using uh, fewer schedulers, but uh, just providing diff uh, different providers, uh, diff uh, different profiles for uh, for, uh, for the nodes. That was a lot of crazy things coming out of uh, that, that SIG, and a lot of them were stable. The interesting thing I think is that a lot of work goes into making that happen. And we see the same thing in SIG storage. Uh, so the first one we'll talk about is the ability to use raw block devices as persistent volume sources. Um, this one's been around since 1.9 as an alpha feature. Uh, it graduated to beta in 1.13 and now it's available just as a, a by default feature. Another stable change is skip volume ownership changes. Um, this one has been in beta since 115 and has graduated now. It's pretty pretty cool to see that evolution. Um, and here's another one supporting raw block storage inside of the, the um, container storage interface. So this has been around since 112 as an alpha feature and beta since 114. Um, all of these things taken together, I think, are, are showing that there's a lot of stability and uh, just maturity happening with um, with SIG storage. Another one um, in SIG storage that's stable is uh, the ability to pass pod information to the CSI drivers uh, to allow them to make a little bit better decisions. Uh, skip attachment for non-attachable CSI volumes. Again, another stable that's been around uh, in beta since 1.14. Um, so just in general, you know, we, when we go back to our themes for the release, fit and finish, uh, SIG storage has really taken on the mantle of um, pushing things towards being stable. 
And then a uh, pretty interesting one that's brand new is the ability for specifying uh, secrets and config maps as immutable. So right now when you make a config map and you load it into a pod, there's actually a, a sync loop that happens. Um, so if you make a change to that config map, it'll be and you mount it as a file system volume uh, in the pod. It'll actually be reflected in the pod at some period later. So you may have a deployment uh, with a couple of, of replicas of a, maybe your, uh, your web server and it's serving some information that came out of that uh, config map. Or maybe you have um, some configuration that you you, uh, you know, reload uh, when things change, like maybe uh, uh, rate limiting rules for the Envoy rate limiter proxy. And you're running those things and you're loading that as a config map. Um, right now, you can actually edit that config map and uh, cause your application to blow up if you make a bad edit to it. Uh, so what this allows you, to, you know, like a better practice is to actually uh, make a new config map and then do like a, a rolling upgrade where you reference the new config map. Um, that's what really this is enforcing. So you're able to specify that secrets and config maps are immutable and it'll prevent edits to those things from happening. And it'll also disable the watch loop. Um, so you won't actually spend time, um, you know, against the API server looking at those things. And then another new alpha feature is generic data populators. Um, you can go take a look at the enhancement uh, proposal for some more information here. Uh, but in 1.12, uh, the data source field was added to the persistent volume claim spec. And this is just enhancing that a little bit more. And another stable. Uh, so we've seen a whole bunch of stables. And this is the last one in SIG storage. Um, this one is enabling uh, the PVC, excuse me, um, to use the data source parameter um, for creating a new one, uh, basically for cloning um, uh, PVCs. All right, on to SIG Windows. SIG Windows is another, uh, like uh, like every single SIG that, uh, SIG that you've seen, uh, that, you, uh, that you've seen until, uh, until now, uh, Windows is definitely, uh, the people from Windows are definitely doing a lot of work. Uh, the first enhancement that we want to talk about, this one is in alpha, uh, this, in, uh, is, this one is in alpha status, uh, and they are constant, uh, constantly working on uh, on this one, is the support for uh, CRI cont uh, container D on Windows. Uh, the Windows Server uh, 2000, uh, 2019 version actually includes an updated host container service that offers more control over how containers are managed. And this can, uh, this can remove some limitations and improve some uh, Kubernetes API comp uh, compatibilities. However, the current Docker, uh, a lot of people are using uh, the, doc uh, the Docker Enterprise uh, tools. Uh, so for example, the Docker uh, Enterprise 1809 release has not been actually updated to work with the Windows uh, host container service. Only, uh, only container that has been mi uh, migrated. So this uh, this enhancement is actually about uh, getting uh, getting up to par and get, uh, getting a lot more uh, tools and runtimes av uh, available for Win uh, for Windows worker nodes. Uh, with this, uh, users will be able to take full uh, advantage of the uh, of the latest uh, features and improvements that have uh, that have been shipped with the Windows to the Server 2009 uh, and 18 uh, and the next one, implementing runtime class on Windows. Uh, this one can be uh, can be used to make it easier to schedule pods on uh, into appropriate nodes based on uh, the OS, uh, the version of the OS, and CP, uh, CPU uh, CPU architecture and any other information that you have uh, that you have around. With Hyper-V available, Windows can run containers or uh, can run containers uh, on multiple Windows or uh, multiple Windows operating system versions and Linux containers might be uh, might, uh, might be able to do this in the future as well. This, uh, this enhancement is going to document the process controlling these features through runtime class and will add new fields to the pod API, changing the, uh, changing the current uh, behavior of the, uh, of the Kubernetes scheduler. And the next one, uh, is support of GNCA for Windows workloads. Uh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Windows GNCA, GNCA stands for Group Managed Service Account. Uh, this is a Windows thing for actually uh, man uh, managing uh, kind of uh, like user accounts and uh, 
service, 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 service accounts in general. Uh, this uh, this enhancement went stable uh, in one uh, in one eighteen, and this will uh, this uh, this will in general just pro uh, just provide more fl uh, fl uh, more flexibility and the full set of, uh, the, uh, the full set of features uh, for uh, for anyone who uh, who currently makes use of EMCA. And the last enhancement from Sync, Win uh, Sync Windows that we have is run as user name for Windows. Uh, this is uh, this provides the ability for people who are uh, running a pod on a, on a Windows worker node to actually specify the uh, username for that uh, application to uh, to run uh, to run under. Uh, this uh, this is some uh, this is somewhat similar to a, a plain old container running uh, running on uh, on Linux where you can specify I want uh, this process to run uh, with uh, some non uh, non pseudo user. And this, fin uh, this finally became stable on uh, 118 and it's ready for production use. And with that, we, are act uh, we actually just uh, cover all the enhancements that went into 118. And uh, with that, let's, uh, let's take it off. Uh, we just want to take uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit about the, re uh, the release team shadow, uh, shadow program, which, uh, encom uh, which encompasses uh, uh, all, uh, a lot, uh, a lot, uh, a lot of the work that we have this, uh, that, that we have discussed until now. For, uh, for example, uh, uh, for example, the tracking of enhancements and and the like. Yeah. So the release team is made up of a few different roles. Um, you have the, the team lead itself, and then enhancements, CI signal, bug triage, uh, all handling different pieces of the release process. Uh, each one of those is led by an individual. So I was the enhancement lead for one eighteen. But you also have um, some shadows. So part of the process to make sure that this process or that the releases can continue to be healthy and um, that we can grow the pool of people that can help us with this is that we bring on shadows for each one of those roles. And it's generally between two, three or four um, shadows for each role. Um, and then you can uh, you come onto the release team and you help out and learn the responsibilities of that um, that specific and that that role. Uh, enhancements, for example, uh, the team and I split up all of the enhancements that are tracked in the Kubernetes enhancements repo. Um, we would ping each one to figure out what was going to happen in that release and kind of shepherd it through the process. Uh, generally, the releases are around three months, but that's changing a little bit right now. Um, the workload varies depending on which team, and which part of the release you're in. So enhancements is kind of front loaded. Release notes and docs are kind of back loaded. Um, so you can kind of gauge, uh, you know, where your interest is and what, um, what your time commitment might look like. But we definitely recommend that you, uh, if you're interested in this at all, apply to be uh, a shadow for the next release, which would be 120. We've already formed the 119 team, uh, but, you know, at the end of each release, you can generally find a link to uh, the application to be a shadow for that upcoming release. So that would be 120 for the next release. And if you're interested about uh, on learning more about the re uh, the release team or the Kubernetes community in general, uh, the release team, like uh, every, any other sub project or SIG uh, within the Kubernetes community, has all the meetings uh, completely open. So mm -hmm. if uh, if you can, you can uh, you can join in, you can uh, ask questions, uh, and the like. And with that, I guess we now open the ground for actual questions about the webinar. And one thing. Yeah, so um, thank you both for that awesome presentation. Um, we'll do a few questions since we're already a little bit over time. Um, so there are a few questions in the queue right now. Um, let's see. Um, a couple people asked about concrete examples for things that could be done with Cube Puddle Debug. I guess, are there any concrete examples of things that can be done with kubectl debug? So uh, one, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the best examples, uh, I, uh, I mentioned this, uh, mentioned this during, the, uh, uh, during that slide, is um, uh, one of the best security practices that we have is uh, if you can, uh, if, you have, uh, if you're using a compiled language for your application, or if you can just get a, a a binary or a really small surf uh, or a really small surface uh, collection of files that you need to run your application uh, in order to avoid actually having an entire 
uh, operating system inside of your containers. Uh, uh, please do that. Uh, for, ex uh, for example, this is, uh, uh, this is where distro-less containers come, uh, come into play. If you Google distro-less containers, uh, you will probably come across a, a repository uh, owned by Google, I, be uh, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the, dist uh, the distro-less containers essentially just give you enough of an operating system. Uh, for example, they, uh, they give you the basic uh, CA certificates and enough tools to just be able to run a uh, by a, a binary, they don't. Uh, they don't have a. Uh, they don't have a shell. They don't. Uh, they don't. They don't provide the opportunity, uh, the tools for you to uh, to install any other uh, tools or executables. So, uh, for example, in uh, in uh, Ubuntu Debian, you cannot do something. Uh, you cannot do a app get install. Blah blah blah. And if you're using uh, if you're using those uh, distro uh, distro uh, images you are more or less securing your application because now you can uh, you have an additional a uh, barrier that is going to uh, ensure that only your application is running uh, that no one can exec into the container and install something else and no, uh, that no one can inject any can uh, any kind of traffic into that and uh, that, that is a that is a good practice to follow however that makes it a uh, somewhat difficult to actually uh, to actually develop and deb uh, and debug your applications because now you cannot uh, now you cannot exec into your container and you don't have any tools to actually uh, to actually test your application or, or to monitor the state of the or to monitor the state of the container and the only uh, with uh, without kubectl debug if you if you actually wanted to debug your application while using a distro less container, you will have to go back to your uh, to your container image, a Docker file, for example. You will have to change uh, from GCR distro list to uh, from Golang 113. Uh, that will actually give you a a, a Debian-like operating system. Then you have to build your image again. You have to push and you have to uh, you have to uh, wait for things to redeploy. A uh, kubectl debug is essentially a, a shortcut to uh, to all that work, and with kubectl debug you can just say kubectl, I have this pod, uh, I want to run a Debian container inside of it, uh, and as soon as I get that container in the same uh, in the same net, uh, network host name namespaces, then I can act, uh, then I can now inst uh, install uh, any tools that I want in. Uh, essentially have your Kubernetes cluster serve as a, a, as your local machine. Yeah, and it's really cool because you can, um, just like when you run Docker uh, and you specify like the dash IT flag to do then like an iterative, um, like, you know, to get the console in the shell, you can do that with the kube, the kube cuddle, uh debug command. Um, it'll start an ephemeral container inside of your existing pod uh, and give you a shell if you do the dash IT. So you can do like kube cuddle debug, um, I dash it uh, run busybox or whatever you Debian or whatever you want to use and insert it as an ephemeral container inside of my existing uh, application to to give you that extra ability to debug things that are running too right like maybe you want to be able to look at this thing that's deployed without having to go through and rebuild the image and redeploy it and lose the state that exists already um, the, the the debug command allows you to you know, to use that ephemeral containers capability get a shell into that thing and, and do whatever debugging you need to do. Awesome. Okay, um, we'll do one more question. Right. Can you shed more light on CSI support enhancements like block storage support, different cloud providers, and performance benchmarks? So I would not be the right person to provide more insight to that. Um, I think the if if you want to know more about those things, uh, what I would recommend is that you join the the SIG um, storage channel on the on the, the Kubernetes Slack. Uh, and read through the enhancements proposals themselves. Um, so I don't have a lot of the, the detailed information uh, at hand. I would have to go read the, the caps themselves uh, to try to, you know, to answer any specific question for you out of those things. Um, but again, the caps are like the source of truth. So anytime a change is going to be made to Kubernetes, it has to go through this enhancement process. And that's called the Kubernetes enhancement process. And all of those things live in Kubernetes slash enhancements uh, on GitHub. So github.com. Uh, slash Kubernetes slash enhancements. Um, you can find all of the things that have been previously implemented, things that are proposed uh, and are being iterated on, uh, like sidecar containers, as an example. Um, you can find uh, all the things that have gone into previous releases uh, there as well. Um, 
when those things are merged uh, and approved, they end up in a KEPS directory. Uh, so in GitHub, you can find, uh, in the in enhancements repo, you can find all of the KEPS that have been merged previously, and they'll give you more info. But if you have specific questions about direction or what the SIG is planning on doing with some more, um, it would be super, you know, like that's the best place to go. It's like the source of truth. Great. Thank you. Um, Jeremy and George, thanks for a great presentation. That's all the time we have questions for today. Thank you, thank you everyone for joining us. The webinar recording and slides will be online later today, and we look forward to seeing everyone at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank, thank you very much. Happy Friday, y'all.